Welcome to Legislative Report. I'm State Representative Kate Harper of the 61st District in Montgomery County. In 2008, Pennsylvania took a big step toward a more open government by passing the Right to Know law. Now all records are presumed to be public, putting the burden of proof on the government instead of on the citizen to prove that some records should not be released. In addition, the Office of Open Records was created to implement the law and to assist people searching for information. The Executive Director of the Office of Open Records, Terry Mutchler, is here today to share the mission of the office and talk about some ideas for potential changes in how the program operates. Welcome to the program, Terry. Thank you very much, Representative. It's actually your second time, but I think the law is uh, maybe seven years old now. Yes, we're, we're really moving up. I mean, it's a good, strong law. Uh, they're still, we're still sort of kicking the tires with some of the issues, but, uh, but Pennsylvania is light years ahead in obtaining information from its government. All right, now I know that you were our first um, Office of Open Records Director, so I guess you had to set the whole thing up and figure out how it works. Can you give the folks um, a little bit of background about what it was like opening the office and what kinds of requests you get? Sure. Uh, opening the Office of Open Records and creating a staff was one of the biggest challenges that I've ever faced, candidly. I had a copy of the law in a cubicle, and uh, over the course of the years, we built this into uh, a 16-person operation. The Office of Open Records has gotten about 12,000 right-to-know requests from viewers like those that are watching you today. 12 thousand? Yes, and that's just the requests. So in addition to the requests, we've handled over 50,000 emails and telephone calls to our office. Wow. Uh, 500 court cases and um, about 1,500 speeches and trainings to try to train public officials and citizens on what to expect under this law. So it was a Herculean effort. It's up and running. And citizens have a great variety of interest in records. Sometimes they want to know how much does the school superintendent earn? How long is his or her contract? Uh, how much did the police department spend on tasers this year? Or, uh, you know, a big one is what state contracts have been given out and to whom? Those no, are big issues. Let me stop issues. you for a second. Go back to the local issues. Sure. You know, what the superintendent earns or, right. uh, you know, how many tasers the police department buys or how many guns. Right. Um, they don't have to go to you for that, right? If a citizen wanted to know that, how do they find out that information? Well, the first thing we recommend is to not even use the right to know law. Just pick up the phone and call your local township, your county, your police department and say, I'm a citizen and I'd like to obtain some information. Can you give me a hand? And if you're someone who's not trying to harass the agency as a, as, you know, and you're genuinely interested in this, um, citizens nine times out of ten will point you in the right direction and get you rolling without a right to know law request. However, sometimes you're required to fill out a right to know law request. The easiest way to do it is to download a form from our uh, website. Or you have a one pager, I one think. One page. And, right. uh, or you can use the form of the agency. Um, some agencies don't even require a form. They just ask you to say, you know, I'm interested in a, obtaining a copy of the superintendent's contract. Here's my name and address. You submit it to the agency. The agency has five business days to respond to you. At the end of the five days, they can invoke another 30 days because believe me when I tell you, five days is not a lot of time for an agency to respond to a request. Well, the request about the superintendent's salary would be easy, but if you want the contract, or something else, they, right. they might want to redact or yeah. block out some personal stuff. Sure, I mean, because, and we do get, here's what you get, Kate, you get, you get two different types of requesters and two different types of responses. On one hand, you have citizens and members of the media that are convinced that every public official is a criminal and wants to hide records. I've met them. Yes, I, I have too. <laughs> <laughs> And on the other hand, you sometimes have public officials that want to make life very difficult for the citizen. At the Office of Open Records, we try to stand in the middle of that breach to say to, to the agencies, look, forget who's asking for the record. Uh, and to the citizens, remember, these public officials have two hands. And if you're asking for one of them, that means something else isn't getting done at taxpayer expense. Right. And the candid reality is you do have some folks that are less than sane. We had a guy uh, in central uh, Pennsylvania who filed 300 right to know requests in a three month period. In the same township? In the same township. Mm -hmm. And you're, 
I don't care who, I don't care how open government you are, you're never going to be able to respond to that in that fashion. And when you dig a little deeper, it's somebody that lost an election, and so there's always a backstory. The easiest thing to do for agencies to keep these right to know requests to a minimum is to put as much public information as they can on their website so that they can just point people to the website, put up your budget, put up your staff salaries. And I know that gets tricky, but remember, they're public record anyway. Um, and if you're a citizen, you know, keep in mind that particular townships suffer a great deal under this law, and there's no other way to say we'll talk that. about that later, yeah. but I do okay. want to talk about what a citizen can get. Oh, well, listen, the way it works in Pennsylvania is this. As of January 1st, 2009, every record held by a government agency is presumed to be a public record. Everything. Everything is presumed to be a public record. It doesn't mean that a citizen's going to get everything. It just means when the agency gets the right to know request, they must presume that what's being asked for is public. Now, there's a lot of material that's not public. So you're not going to get, and we've had these requests, you're not going to get the health records of the mayor. You're not going to get a mayor's social security number. You're not going to get, we've had um, well, prisoners that, that could be identity theft or other there's a ton of stuff out there we actually had a case where an inmate candidly was harassing a public official and that same inmate it's over in Lebanon County uh, ended up obtaining the how I don't know but he ended up obtaining information related to a police detective's wife and he destroyed her credit from inside a prison wow. and so you know we you know see... with a brain like that if he'd only used it for good right and you know you see a lot of you see a lot of snags, but you also see the right to know law that comes to good end. We've had situations where um, a right to know request revealed that uh, uh, that uh, a school district was serving expired food to children. Wow. We found a right to know a right to know request that um, discovered that another school district, unfortunately, had uh, employees who had been dismissed for four months still on the payroll. Uh, up in the in this in the northern part of the state, you had in the northeastern part of the state a right to know request um, unraveled a, a towing scam that the FBI got involved into. So there's a lot of uh, um, right to know requests that we see that directly save taxpayer money, but you also see very voluminous requests, people that will ask for any and all you know, emails since the and beginning you of know time. This, but that's so, a lawyer phrase, any yeah, and all. Right. I know. And so, but what we try to say is Pennsylvania has one of the strongest right to know laws in the United States of America right now. And we need to keep um, trying to, uh, to ensure that that law stays strong. And at the same time, we balance the, what happens at an agency because again, Agencies are overworked, they have less money to, to carve out, and when you're dealing with voluminous, repetitive right-to-know requests, that really can be a burden on the agency. All right, now I know that when we passed this law, our goal was that citizens should know what's going on. It's sure. their money, it's their government, it's you know the people they elect who are you know doing things, and so they should know about that. But we also thought that newspaper reporters would use it a lot. Now your background is, journalism, isn't it? So yeah. tell us a little bit about who you are and tell us whether it's turned out to be mostly reporters or sure. who's filing these. Uh, my background is I, when I graduated from Penn State, I became a journalist. I worked for the Morning Call in Allentown. I worked for the Associated Press in Harrisburg and a few other states. Then I w went into politics and the law school and worked for, I clerked for the Supreme Court in Illinois. Uh, spent much of my adult career in Illinois and then came back at the request of Governor Rendell to create this agency as a as a lawyer, public official, and a former journalist. But he picked you also because Illinois had some experience with this, yes. right? Uh, you had some yes. experience in we, Illinois. I was the first public access counselor in the state of Illinois and I had established a similar agency. And uh, I, I had never met Governor Rendell before I came, but that's, I was... I was chosen for this because of the experience of doing this in Illinois. And Illinois and Pennsylvania are very, they're almost twin sister types of states. All right, and now you're a Upper Dublin girl. You live in Montgomery County, do. don't you? I do live in Montgomery County. I live in Upper <laughs> Dublin. And, uh, and I see firsthand, just from, from both as a citizen myself, I see the good effect and the bad effect of the right to know law. One of the unintended consequences that I believe we never saw coming down the pike was the number of inmates that use this law. About 40% of the appeals that we deal with at the Office of Open Records, probably almost 50%, 
come from inmates. And what do they but, ask for? And they got plenty of time oh, on their hands, yeah, they I have, know. Yes. So. Um, but what they ask for is a wide range of things, but some are very, in my opinion, frivolous. You know, they ask, what is the quality of the underwear that guards are given versus the quality of the underwear that inmates are given? What's the nutritional value of the food that they are served versus what the guards are served? Many of them uh, want to obtain what the policies are for uh, sex offenders so that they can understand how the system works a little better so that they can actually try to game, game the system. Yeah. But to your question about the press, what's one of the most fascinating dynamics about the right to know law is everybody thought it was going to be a media driven law. Right, we really did. Yeah. I voted you for know? it. I was in favor <laughs> of it, but I really worried that it would be, I don't know, 60 minutes every day or something. You uh, know yeah, what I mean? no, it's not. Uh, only of the 12,000 requests, only 4%, 4% have been from members of the media. Well, I have to say this, because when whenever someone makes a right to know request of the legislature, we're all notified. And right. that does seem to happen on a weekly basis. Yeah, you guys <laughs> have a you have your own appeals set up. It's a little different than than local agencies, but I don't know what your so I don't know what the numbers are for the legislature. What I can tell you for the ten thousand units of local government that are subject to the right to know law and for the state of the re of appeals that we received at the Office of Open Records, f um, the the number one requester type is a citizen. Okay. The second uh, largest group of requesters uh, is public officials. They use this law to obtain information about most each states, other. Yeah, but in, in, it's it's even beyond that. In most states, the, their right to know law or equivalent says if you're a sitting public official and you need the information to do your job, you don't even have to file a right to know sure. request which makes sense, it makes good sense. Pennsylvania doesn't have that component, so if you want information and, and well, here's an example. And one of my uh, constituent right. local governments or school districts won't give it to me, although right. I have to say, all of mine are very open that way. Yeah. And you know, right, what we see in that, in that regard is, um, for example, we saw public officials in Harrisburg use the right to know law to garner information that the city refused to turn over about the incinerator. Mm. So it was to good effect there. And then the third component of people that come on a, uh, on request is the media at, at about 4%. Now, those numbers change when it comes to the Office of Open Records. So after the local agency denies the, if they deny the request and it comes to us, that's considered an appeal. And, and the, your office handles appeals. Yes, we are okay. kind of like a we are a, the, we are a quasi judicial agency that reviews the appeals. Basically, what we do is we review the packet to determine if the agency met its burden of proof. If the agency proved that their reason for withholding the record was valid. All right, and I'll stop for a second because I have heard from the Department of Environmental Protection mm -hmm. that they get an awful lot of requests. Oh yeah, they do. They uh, do. Most of them are not appeals because they fulfill them, but mm -hmm. they they. They did mention it's uh, something I was at that they get an awful lot of requests. So, if if the agency fulfills the request, you never hear about it. We never it. see it, and okay. and so we only see appeals. They they only come to us when an agency has denied the request. When when a state agency or the governor's office or a local agency, township, county, school district says no, you can't have this record, then by law that requester can come to us and say, I believe this record is public. And we review it and we'll make that determination. And that Now, do you think that the local governments and the school districts have gotten better at complying with the law? I mean, I think in the beginning, none of us were really sure that it meant all records unless it's got an exception. Right, right. Yeah. I think that, um, that local governments, townships, counties, agencies, even the state, even us, <laughs> We've all gotten better at handling this law. We've now been around it for about seven years, and I believe that what I see on a consistent level is agencies handling the law correctly. And a lot of times we're still trying to convince citizens that even if an agency denies a record, it does not mean they're anti-open government. It means that they followed the law, and you ask for a 911 tape, we'll say, and you're not gonna get that under the law, so the agency did everything properly and denied it. So, but we see an overwhelming volume of appeals from prisoners. And uh, we- they probably don't believe it when they get uh, a denial. Uh, yeah, and I'll tell you this, the Department of Corrections, they have my highest respect because the Department of Corrections has handled more right to know requests than anyone in the state. 
they've done it in a very pro-open government fashion and since I've been here seven years and um, and they they really are fair in their analysis we all make mistakes we make mistakes at the Office of Open Records but given the volume they have a very high success rate at these requests I do think that as we look at legislation I do think that we need to address the, I don't think any of us ever intended for 50% of the appeals to come from inmates. Right. It's not, this law was not designed for them. It's no. designed for the everyday citizen that wants to understand what their public officials are doing. And as the courts have said, it's designed to promote maximum access and prevent secretive uh, government. government. Well, all right, hold on that thought and what we can do to change the law and make it better because we have to take a quick break. Legislative Report will return in just a moment. Stay with us. Did you know that Act 16 of 1999 honors one of the greatest leaders in the Pennsylvania House of Representatives. The Matthew J. Ryan Legislative Office Building, once known as the Capitol Annex, is located next to the main Capitol building and honors the late Speaker of the House, Matthew J. Ryan. Those who visit this building will observe the magnificent architectural designs providing eloquence and grandeur to the building. Known as one of the greatest members in the history of the Pennsylvania State House, Matthew Ryan started his career in the legislature in 1963 and was elected speaker in 1981. His charisma and knowledge will forever be reflected in the building now named after this great legislative leader. Now you know. Welcome back to the program. I'm State Representative Kate Harper. and My guest today is Terry Mutchler, Executive Director of the Office of Open Records. We're discussing Pennsylvania's right to know law and what it means for you as a Pennsylvania citizen. And where we left off was, we had seven years of experience now. It is working yes. in most cases. Yes. But there are some things that the legislature's been looking at to see if we should change them. I'll just throw a few out and see you know, whether you have an opinion that you want to express on, sure. on any of them. Um, I think some legislature, legislative leaders don't think that, that the Office of Open Records or the Corrections Department should be spending so much time on what they view as silly prisoner requests. You know, you don't lose all your rights when you go into prison, but you lose an awful lot of them. And the law, um, the law was designed for the citizen. And here we are, we have limited resources in government. And if we are answering your question about underwear of guards versus underwear of, of inmates, then maybe we're not, uh, I don't know what else you have to do at the prison, keeping good count or something. Right. So um, are there, there, there was that question. The other issue that's come up is, um, should home addresses be public? And I think there are legislators on both sides of this. Mm -hmm. Some people think if you're receiving a public taxpayer paid check, we should be able to know who you are and where you live. Mm -hmm. And other people think in this day and age, it's a security problem. So. Um, among the things we've been talking about in the legislature, there's, there's another one. Um, some people are using the right to know law or open records law strictly for commercial things. Oh, um, yeah. Lots of people have had this experience. Somebody comes in and writes down all the building permits, and then, and then everybody who wants to put a swimming pool in gets a, an inquiry from a fence company. Right. Or somebody writes down or gets all of the police reports and everybody's had a car accident gets a letter from a lawyer. Mm -hmm. um, how do you feel about that? Do we need to tune up the law a little well, bit? Well, I'll take these in reverse order. The answer is we do need to tune up the law. The law was never designed for commercial requesters and it is my personal belief as the head of the Office of Open Records that uh, commercial requests should not be borne out on the backs of taxpayers' wallets. And so... Why should the town township be paying the building inspector to give somebody who, who applied for a pool permit. Right. And so you get into some tricky situations with that. My proposed resolution to this is to have a bifurcated system for payment. Okay, could you speak, say that in English? Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. 
I think if you're a citizen, a student, or someone that is attempting to get records, a member of the media, and you want records under the right to know law, you should get them as they are now, uh, t 10 to 25 cents a page. Right, you get them for free if you don't want a copy. You can right. just look at exactly. them, right? Exactly. Okay. However, if you are uh, the folks that are trying to turn a buck on the right to know law, I believe that you should pay a commercial fee and or a labor fee. That's how the Federal Freedom of Information Act does it. Okay. So if you run a pool lining company and you want public records to turn into a marketing list, you should have to pay for that. And th that way the township would have revenue coming in to support yes. the employees' costs. Yes. And I believe in that scenario that that's appropriate because we have seen, we've seen it all over the state. We've seen folks who want to start dog grooming businesses asking for copies of everybody that owns a dog. We've seen the pool example that you have. The list is endless. And I do think that we need the, I encourage the legislature to keep its eye on citizen requesters and, and not newspapers. On commercial Although, requesters. technically speaking, um, a journalist is getting paid and is selling their product. They're not commercial See, use. There's a different. They're not commercial use, and other states have tried to 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 push that, and that's where you get into the tricky business. So we have to the, write that very carefully. Uh, yeah, you would have to write that very carefully because uh, I, it is my firm belief, uh, and it's what the courts have said. In fact that, you know, the business of the press is part of the democracy itself, sort of the fourth estate. It so, is. you know, sure. um, so that has to be written in in that component. Plus, the law's designed to be open. And if right. we shut out the press, we're really shutting out the eyes and ears of most people, most right. citizens. That's right. You know? And as to the uh, issue of, of inmates, it's my belief that um, that when inmates are, are put into prison that they do lose a certain level of rights, not all their rights. The Supreme Court has said such. And so there are many states that what they do um, is they say if you are a prisoner, you can get information, but not under the state's Freedom of Information Act or the state's right to know law, depending on what state you're in. And so what they do is they seek their information from the Department of Corrections. And uh, Senate is Bill- Is that better? Um, because you st you still have to have a mechanism for, you know, every time I think of this, I think of the, you know, sort of Gideon's trumpet, where I do believe that there are abuses that occur in prison. There are things that, that prisoners do need to be able to know about, and the citizens need to know about right, the Department I of Corrections. Right, but I once saw a prisoner complain about bologna and cheese for lunch. Right, and I'm not that suggesting that the... I didn't think it was that unfair myself. The, those, are, those are not... Those are not the, we can all point to ones that are ludicrous, that, you know, the underwear case, right. you know, those things. But, for example, we had a right to know request from a prisoner who wanted to know what are the drugs that are used in, um, in the death penalty uh, That's a fair question. Right. Because it could and be that they are, you know, for one reason or another, unconstitutional or cruel and unusual punishment or whatever. Right. If they don't work well enough, they might be. And, you know, we've seen other right to know requests about where does the Department of Corrections, where does the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania purchase those drugs? Are they purchased from state-owned companies, some in the United States or overseas? And so you do have legitimate requests. I think that the way some other states have done this is, is perfect. You still give the prisoner an avenue to obtain information, but it's not by right under Within the state. Within so know. many days exactly. and all the yes. rest of it. And so okay. there's that. Home addresses is a big issue in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. The legislature saw fit to say that your home address is available unless you were a judge, uh, a minor, or uh, a member of law enforcement. Right, and that's because thereof. we were worried that some criminal would, would yes. uh, I don't know, take revenge on the judge who sent him up the river. Right. So we were worried about that, but at the same time we felt that we had a requirement to right. be open to the public. And one of the, I, Pennsylvania is one of the very few states that have home addresses of public employees available. Teachers, most states, for example. Yeah, most states say no. And the reasoning for those is if somebody asks for a teacher's home address, it's it's generally not for a holiday card. I mean, there's, well, you know. Well, I don't know. We have a Pennsylvania Association of School Retirees that, that made a big fuss over not being able to find right. potential retirees or new retirees. And so this is the split that you have. And I think as members of the Press Association uh, argue that you can go to Google or White Pages and get these. You sure can. You know, uh, I actually believe that Pennsylvania needs to be more judicious about the release of home addresses because I've seen firsthand some of the problems that come up with it. 
Um, and but you actually got your finger on something that we didn't talk about, which is that the requester doesn't have to say why they want the information. That's right. And so um, you, uh, because many times what happens is an agency will say, why do you want this? And it provides a chilling kind of effect. Right. At the same token, we've seen right to know requests that have gone out to town, the township that governs Three Mile Island, where they've asked for the security plans to Three Mile Island. And in what world are you not going to say, and what it, what is it that you want these for? <laughs> right. Um, you know, so. Um, I just want to so, make sure they're doing a good job. <laughs> oh. You know, so, and there are some uh, provisions in the law, many strong provisions that would permit an agency to withhold those type of records. You're going to, you're going to see, you know, a lot of records about financial spending, but there's 31, there's 30 exceptions to the state's right to know law. So there's 30 instances when an agency can withhold a record because it's going to cause a security risk, it's going to cause an infrastructure problem, um, uh, that, that, you know, that it's going to um, uh, harm, you know, um, I'm sorry, I'm not speaking very well there, but like if you're asking for health records, you're not going to get it. You're not going to get well, DNA Because they're records. protected right. by something else. And they're also protected under this. So you, you're not going to get those. But as the, as the Supreme Court of the Commonwealth said and the Commonwealth Court said, this law is designed for maximum access to prevent secrecy and so that citizens can know how much taxpayer money is being spent and they can make good solid decisions uh, about both how taxpayer money is being spent and how public officials are acting. And it's your belief as the only Office of Open Records executive we've ever had here, <laughs> executive director, that um, it's, it's working. It is definitely working, and we have had input. We've had folks from, we've had judges from Tokyo. We've had members of The Hague ask us to talk about how we built the Pennsylvania model. I've testified before Congress and at least seven other states because they believe this is the model to duplicate. Well, we had a long way to go, as I recall, at the time we did oh. pass the law, and so it was very important to get it right. Now, just 30 seconds on a topic people are thinking about these days, which is if the policeman has a little camera on his lapel, is that an open record situation? That would be presumed to be an open record. If you file a right to know request today and you want dash cams, uh, you know, the video from a dash cam, you can get that in certain circumstances. But what if you if, just want to, I don't know, prosecute the policeman for being too rough on an arrest? The, the way it would work now is, let's say something happens in that scenario, let's say someone is shot, that's probably going to be an investigative record and not available. However, keep in mind that a record is no longer just a piece of paper, it's information. So it could be a video, a book, mm -hmm. it could be a, a handwritten note, it can certainly be a dash cam, it could be the, the film from a lapel cam. Um, and so these are the areas of technology that I believe that the state needs to address in, in its next version of the right to know law, as well as records retention. Um, and so- and Keep holding on to records how exactly. long. Right. right, because right now in the Commonwealth, you know, we have right to know requests for tweets or for Twitter accounts, oh, for Lord. Facebook. And if you're a public official or a public agency, um, Keep in mind that that presumption is that the record is available. And we'll be there. Yep. All right. Well, we're going to have to stop there. That's all the time we have for today's program. Um, my guest today was Terry Mutchler from the Office of Open Records. I'm State Representative Kate Harper. If you need assistance with this or any other state government matter, feel free to contact me at my local office. The address and number will be shown in just a moment. Thanks for watching. Please join me again for Legislative Report.